Nope, those are for you. Now we're just going to pick up from where we left off last time. Now last time when I saw you guys, we got just a chance to do really the first half of the Madisonian model. So I want to revisit this and then we'll do the last, the last half. When Madison's writing out the Constitution, he's afraid of democracy. He should be. He's afraid of the mob and what they can do. So Madison says, I'm going to create this system of government that is, yes, democratic, but it's not a democracy. Remember, he doesn't want a democracy. He wants a republic. So he sets up all these things for safeguards, protections from too much power. Now, we talked last time about separation of power and checks and balances. Today, we're going to talk about the two that are usually more complicated. The third one that we're going to do today is going to be federalism. Now, when I asked you guys before, I got kind of a mixed reaction. Federalism, is this at least ringing a bell? I'm, I'm sort of. Okay. Like, I know the word, I don't know about it. Okay, let's talk about what it means then. Federalism is separating powers. But it's not separating between the branches. It's separating powers by level. This is the division of power between federal responsibilities and state responsibilities. Both federal and state have their spheres of influence, where there are going to be some things that are just federal powers that states cannot touch. Some things are just state powers. Federal can't touch them. So I want to ask first, what might be a power that just the federal government has? States can't touch it. The military? Ah, the military is one thing. Federal government has control over the military. They can declare war. They can engage in international conflicts. This is good that federal alone has that power. Because if the states had that power, it would be a mess. Wyoming would invade France and Wyoming would win, but that's a whole other issue. Let's do the other side. State powers are always a little bit more difficult, so let me ask you. What do you think might be one thing that just states can do, that federal can't touch? Always harder. Sasha, you want to take a shot? Well, is it like the legalization of marijuana? Like, is that your place, or is that? Because like, some of the federal there too. That Let's put to... a pin in that for right okay. now. We're going to revisit that in a little bit here. But I'm talking about this, uh, let me say it like this. Show of hands who drove to school today. I was driving to school. Did you break any federal laws driving to school today? No. I certainly hope not. Did you break any state laws driving to school today? Yeah. <laughs> yeah oftentimes they feel they know, like you're a liar. <laughs> Sasha, what law did you break this morning, do you think? I drive people when I'm not like supposed to. Too young. It is my responsibility as a citizen to tell the police. <laughs> <laughs> Sasha, I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah, I broke the law today, too. What? I broke the law today, too. Oh, what'd you do? You speeding. I was going 35 and a 30. Wow. It's your responsibility to report me That's now, okay? This is something that just state has. Now, I bring this up because there are different areas that we divide it up. But there's one big underlying rule when we divide state power and federal power. States can create any laws they want as long as they do not conflict with federal. Uh oh. Is Colorado in Sasha, you were once ahead of me. The marijuana? Yeah. Colorado and a handful of other states are doing something that's a little weird, but it's not necessarily out of the ordinary. States will pass laws that go against federal and basically challenge the federal government and say, what are you going to do about it? As of right now, Colorado and a handful of other states 
when their marijuana laws are literally challenging the federal government, going against a federal law and saying, come down here and make us stop. Now, let me ask you, at any time, could the federal government show up and start shutting all the marijuana businesses down? No. Yeah. Federal and supreme <laughs> to the states. At any point, the FBI could show up and just start arresting everyone. All the people that are working for or own and operate any kind of dispensaries are all breaking federal law. Now, this is where things get a little bit strange. Because there's an old saying, the states are the laboratories for the federal governments. We are allowed to experiment with different things at the state level before they become federal law. We are given a great deal of autonomy we can make any law we want as long as it doesn't conflict federal law. And as long as they don't come down here and make us comply. This is what the founders wanted. They give the states all sorts of power. They let them run their own affairs. Now today, the federal government has more power than they ever have before. And they still let the states run their own affairs. There's one thing that state governments understand way better than the federal governments their own people. Are things a little different in Utah than New York? Yeah. Yes. We allow for flexibility. Now here's the thing. This is really all I have for federalism, because federalism can be fairly straightforward. Are we good with this idea? Mm -hmm. Last one is probably the most complex. The last one, even Madison had kind of a hard time explaining it. The way he explains it is brilliant, but we have to be careful. Because something that we have seen ever since you were children, and you guys know, in a democracy, majority rules. rules, majority wins. Madison even says, yes, in our democratic republic, the majority wins. But we need to be very careful. We need to limit how much power the majority has over the minority. Because if we just had a straight, pure democracy, it can devolve into mob rule. Just whoever has the most numbers can steamroller over the minority. Madison wanted to be certain that in our republic, that doesn't happen. That we don't devolve into the rule of the mob. So I always kind of use this little example here. If we had Jeff Bezos walk into this room and we are a pure democracy, and we vote and say, Mr. Bezos, we've all voted. We have voted to take all of your money and divide it up amongst ourselves equally. Majority in here. Do we win in that little scenario? Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure do. Don't worry about going to school anymore. All your problems are solved. But who loses? Him. Yeah. That one individual who is not in the majority. We need to be certain those people that are in the minority are protected. So what Madison comes up with is a system. It's brilliant the way he does it, but it is almost counterintuitive to what we know about a democracy. We need to be certain we have things in place to protect those that are in the minority. Now, when Madison is writing out the Constitution, he looks at this in such a way where he says, I want to be certain that the minority is protected by keeping power away from the rule of the mob. Oops, I'm sorry, went too fast. I want to keep power away from the rule of the mob. I need to, and it's a quote, insulate certain parts of our government from the majority. I need to keep a barrier between the mob and that position of power. Now what I want to show you here is an icon of this. Now, this is gonna be the last thing that we cover, but it does take some explanation. So I'll tell you, if you just wanna copy down this icon, fine. If you wanna do bullet points, I really don't care. Whatever makes sense for you. This is gonna be what Madison kind of envisions as far as protecting and insulating different pieces of the government from the mob. Now, let me just kind of explain this one at a time here. First off, this big blob on the left is what Madison sees as the mob. 
Average voters. He wants to insulate certain parts of the government, especially one is the president. Now I want to ask real fast, first off, do we see how we have the voters, the line here, the electoral college, and the line here? The electoral college acts as a barrier between the mob and the president. So I want to ask real fast, do you guys know how the electoral college works? Yes. Yes, okay. I get varying responses, so let me just say this real fast. The electoral college are the people that actually elect the president. This system was created to make every state important when it comes to the presidential election. So in Colorado, we hold our vote for the presidency in just a couple of months. We have nine electors. Now I want to ask, you know, why is our number nine? What is it? Tasha, you know? It's something with our number, but I don't know what the number is, but for a certain number of people in your state, you get a vote. You're absolutely right. It's based on how many members you have in the House of Representatives. We have seven members in the House, plus our two senators. So we're worth nine. Whoever wins the popular vote of Colorado gets all nine of our electoral votes. Now I want to ask real fast, because we're a pretty small state. Do you know what the biggest state the union is? California. California. Do you know how many electoral votes they have? 55 electoral votes. Whoever wins California, and I'm just going to tell you right now, it'll be Joe Biden, wins 55 electoral votes. Now, like I said, this system is made up in such a way where it's a barrier between the voters and the presidency. Because when the system was first created, those electors, they can vote for whoever they want. So let's just say that was still in place. In California, I'll go ahead and call it, Joe Biden wins California. Those 55 electors could go to Washington and say, the people of California want Joe Biden. I don't care, we're voting for Donald Trump. Is that a barrier between the voters and the power of the presidency? Yes. Yes. Today, though, most states have laws on the books where the electors have to go vote for who the state told them to. So it is still a barrier, but it's not the way that Madison originally designed it. Now, before I go any farther, do we see how that's a barrier? Okay, let me go real fast then. The Senate used to be chosen by state legislators, by our Colorado Congress. Not anymore. We've changed that. We have now taken this out. Average voters now directly pick who the senators are. Do we see how this barrier has been taken out? Yeah. Okay. Last thing, House of Representatives, direct vote. We get to pick who our members of the House are. There's one other thing on here that I want to point out. What do you see about the connection for voters to the judicial branch? There isn't anything. How do you become a federal judge? Elected by the president. I like that. What was it? Nominated. Nominated by the president and then? Confirmed by the Senate. Do we get to vote on who's in the judicial branch? No. Nope. But do we get to vote for who's in the presidency and the Senate? So indirectly we do. Now, I know this thing is the most bizarre. Are we okay with this stuff? I have good news for you. Yeah. We're done with notes. To put your notebooks away, and I have just enough time to get to where I want to be. I want to show you a movie. God bless America. See again, sorry. You'll see. It's all on uh, on school. Now, I wanted to take this time today just to start this, because what we are going to begin today is going to be our Netflix series, The O.J. Simpson Murder Trial. This is called The People vs. O.J. Simpson, An American Crime Story. I, I guess I should ask, have you guys ever seen this before? No. Someone? Yeah. 
Now let me explain kind of the small picture and the big picture. First off, 